Hello, everybody. My name is Lee Chinitz. I'm the CTO here at Octoscope, and I'm the moderator for today's session. First of all, just thank you all for, for joining us. Let me, uh, let me get started. Before, um, before I get started, I'll just mention, you know, again, we are, we are Octoscope. We're maker of uh, wireless personal test beds. Um, and we have been doing uh, these tutorial sessions now for the last several months. This, I believe, is number 10. Uh, and as we'll show later, uh, all of the information that we uh, have given, all the sessions have been archived uh, on our website. You can feel free to uh, go back and view any of those if you didn't see them before and view this one again if you, uh, if you really enjoy it. Our topic for today is uh, Wi-Fi mesh. Um, our speaker is Yane Linkola who is the um, Director of Product Marketing here at Octoscope. Yane has a uh, very broad background uh, in all aspects of Wi-Fi, uh, including work at um, operators, uh, as well as equipment manufacturers, and now at a uh, testing company. Um, I think it's Yane's work with the operators that um, has given him a strong interest in this topic of mesh. And uh, he has done some really good work in terms of figuring out how the requirements that operators have for um, mesh devices can be tested in a personal test bed uh, like the ones that uh, we have at Octoscope. So he's going to walk you through a lot of uh, what we hope is uh, very interesting information to you today. Um, and um, we very much welcome your input and feedback. So. Um, I will mention that we do these sessions live, although we do archive them, but we do them live on purpose. Uh, we do enjoy the interaction. Uh, we think it really helps the session when people ask questions. So um, there's a whole crew of us that will be moderating or at least watching the questions that they come in. We'll answer some of them um, uh, just directly. Um, but others we will open up for, um, for discussion uh, with Yane. And so definitely feel free to uh, put your questions into the chat window. You have a Q&A window. Uh, you can raise your hand. So there's a number of ways you can get at us and uh, we will keep watching for that. So with that, uh, let me turn it over to Yane. Thank you, Lee. So yes, today's session is about Wi-Fi mesh, a, a very hot topic currently for the last, say, three or four, four years. Uh, there has been a lot and lot of activity in the space, but um, the technology actually has quite long roots. As with many other technologies, the roots are in the military. In the 1980s and 90s, the, the federal government in, in USA put um, quite a bit of research dollars into researching how personnel, vehicles, command posts, um, assets could form ad hoc networks uh, where the, wherever they happen to be in and how they could communi communicate resiliently. That technology started uh, trickling down to the civilian life. My first exposure in this space was in the very early 2000s when the industry started talking about smart cities. There was a very famous and a very influential RFP that the city of Philadelphia issued uh, in 2005, where they laid out a vision of blanketing in essentially the entire city of Philadelphia with Wi-Fi, thus giving internet access to all the citizens of the, of the, of the city, and thus making the city a, you know, a more productive and equal place to live in, I suppose. I don't believe that particular plan ever got built, but uh, it inspired a lot of other cities to do the same. As a result, uh, many ISPs started building networks like this. Uh, very famously, Comcast actually built Philadelphia, as well as Cablevision built a similar very big network in the New York uh, tri-state area. You know, Simultaneously to this, of course, there was a lot of Wi-Fi deployment in the, in the enterprise driven by productivity needs in the, in the office and you know, universities, hospitals, what have you. Now, in the 2010s, venture capital money started flowing into a consumer sort of at-home version of this technology. Lots of startups got funded, uh, one of them being Eero that got picked up by Amazon a couple of years ago. Google put 
money into their version of uh, mesh Wi-Fi. And more recently, the ISPs have really started being active in this space. Um, the last we counted, there are out of the top 30 ISPs in United States, I believe about 25 have launched some version of mesh Wi-Fi uh, already. And these deployments are accelerating. Now, at the same time, various kinds of standards and technology specifications have evolved. There's uh, specifications from IEEE, 802.11s, being the first one that just defined um, you know, the mesh protocol in between nodes. Then they came up with 802.11k, V, and R, addressing various management and, and, and steering aspects, as well as R being the, the fast roaming standard. In 2018, Wi-Fi Alliance published um, something that a certification program that they call Easy Mesh. This is another attempt at specifying uh, the interface in between mesh nodes for vendor interoperability. Has moderate success. The last I checked, I think there are 30 devices that have certification, mostly in the ISP mesh um, side of the space. Just to further illustrate how, how hot this market is, here are some uh, images that I grabbed uh, last night from Amazon. Um, there are really lots and lots of products in the space. Um, on the retail side, sort of direct to consumer space, uh, most of these products come in packets of um, of two or three nodes, mostly three. Now, notably, the ISP market is is, is quite different. Uh, the most typical deployment um, of mesh in, in Wi-Fi or an extender in Wi-Fi is, is really only one unit. And I'd say about 95% of the deployments have only one, one extender uh, in there. Now, why is this all happening? Well, of course, it's about coverage, right? Um, you know, Consumers and, and employees really demand good coverage, you know, great internet access speeds. And, and, and for that, you know, we just need to build a lot of Wi-Fi access points. There is a sort of an issue with Wi-Fi that people call uh, the bad apple phenomenon that's important to understand in this context. And that is that while Wi-Fi achieves very high speeds uh, when you're close to the access point, and while Wi-Fi also delivers pretty nice coverage, I mean, you can cover an entire house with Wi-Fi. You don't get those two things simultaneously, right? The, the coverage is achieved by very aggressive rate adaptation on the physical layer. Uh, it, in fact, there is three orders of magnitude of, of rate ad adaptation. So what that means is that a station at the edge of the coverage might be using thousand times more airtime for the same service as a station closer to the access point. So, so the, the, these these stations are called bad apples. You know, we don't want them around. It's not okay to only have ninety percent of of stations in good coverage because if ten percent are in bad coverage, they are bad apples and they destroy pretty much the the, the service for for all stations. So that's another reason why we need good coverage. Anyway, today's session is going to be very demo oriented. The first demo that we're going to do is, is basically a variant of a test that I think most of us are uh, familiar with, rate versus range. In this variant, what we're going to do is simulate movement from an access point, a kind of a root access point, uh, radially away from it uh, towards the direction of an extender and then beyond. And hopefully what we will see is uh, the stopping of a, of a typical rate versus range curve where um, you know we're getting great speeds when we're close to the access point. And then as we uh, move uh, further away, we're gonna see a decrease in, um, in the throughput. But as we are handed over to the extender, hopefully we'll see uh, a bump in the performance and also a range extension further away. We will be performing the demo uh, in the StackMax system from Octoscope. It looks like this uh, this thing here on the left. As I said, uh, we have a two node mesh set up in there. The root node is on the, the top chamber and the extender is set up in one of the smaller chambers here below. 
Uh, we're going to be using the Octoscope StayPal product as the station. Remember, this is our test instrument that can simulate lots of different kinds of kinds of stations. And, and we're going to be doing the, the demo completely manually by, by essentially uh, manipulating two attenuators here as we go. So anyway, let's, let's jump onto the demo. So what we're looking at here uh, is the Octoscope uh, UI. Many of you are familiar with this. I'm going to start some traffic here. Uh, and uh, we're going to start uh, the test from a point where the, the stay pal, the station is connected to the root. Now, this particular mesh can deliver about 600 megabits per second. As you can see, we're, we're, we're at an RSSI here. The stay pal is experiencing an RSSI of, um, of roughly neg 40, maybe neg 38. And we're at a phi rate of, um, of over um, 800 megabits per second. This is a stay pal is a, is a two by two device, but the mesh under test here is an AC mesh only. And as you can see, the root attenuator is uh, set to zero. So we're very close to the root and the extender is set to 90. So we are quite a, far away from it. So let's start moving towards the, ext uh, the extender. So basically we're gonna start decreasing the attenuation um, towards the extender, increase the uh, attenuation towards the root. As you can see, our RSSI is going down. We added 12 dB. So correspondingly, we, we went from neg 38 to neg 50. The fire rate hasn't adapted yet. We're still at the, the good throughputs here. Uh, we're gonna move close to the extender. Add attenuation to the root, uh, simulating movement further away. So RSSI is reacting. Let's add a little bit of more uh, attenuation. So we're starting to now see some fire rate adaptations. Now we're at speeds of roughly 400 megabits per second. Make this a little quicker. Now, as you can see, I'm adding more attenuation towards the root node. And, and as you can see, we're, um, we're going down on throughput quite a bit. We are now at close to 100 megabits per second here. Our RSSI was uh, roughly neg 80. And there you go. Here we see a roaming event uh, to the extend. As you can see, the extender attenuator is set to zero. Uh, we're very close to the extend. The root attenuator is set to 90. There's no way we can be connected to the root. We're at uh, neg 40 RSSI. So therefore we are very close. We, we must be connected to the extender. Now, interestingly, our throughput is only 300 megabits per second. Now I should say that the root node and the mesh node that we're using here, they are identical hardware-wise. So why are we getting only half the throughput from the extender? Well, this particular extender model happens to be a dual band extender and it's serving the station with the same chipset that it's performing the backhauling. So every packet in this test gets sent twice by that radio. So therefore, we can only get half the speed. So that's why we're seeing half the speed from the extender compared to the root. So anyway, let's move further away from the extender. We should see uh, RSSI going down, our speed going down at some point. So now we're quite far away, and, and this is basically the, uh, the range benefit that we were looking for in that demo. Let's see if we can move the, the station back to the root. And just, uh, let's go closer to the root here. Uh, add some attenuation to the extender. Uh, let's see if we can see how it back to the uh, All right, and there you go. Uh, this is now a handover back uh, to the root. As you can see, we're back at MIG-40 and uh, the throughput is closer to 600 megabits per second. So this can only be achieved through the road mode. So there you go. A, a live demonstration of roaming and steering in a mesh. Now, how do I know it's, it's it, uh, steering really happened? Well, I took a trace uh, in, in our practice run yesterday. Here's a, here, here is that trace. Um, as we can see, the mesh is really issuing DSS transition management requests. It's giving a BSSID candidate here. 
the station uh, takes about, what is that, 200 milliseconds to react to that. Uh, it sends a, a response to, to the steering uh, root node and starts authentication and reassociation process with the with the target VSSI. So it it in fact was really a 802.11b steer that our Staypal uh, reacted in about 200 milliseconds. Let's see. Then. Am I seeing some uh, some message uh, questions so far? Uh, we Snow? have one person who is wondering about the antenna specs of the DUT in the current demo. Um, so I had actually tried to clarify if this was a question about the, the mesh product and the response was no specs of the DUT, but the DUT is in fact the mesh product. So I guess the this question is asking about antenna specifications for the, the DUT. I don't know if there's anything you feel like you want to say about that. Yeah, it's uh, the, the product of, well, we're not, you know, we're, we're trying to be vendor neutral. So, um, you know, we don't promote or discourage any products here. Uh, this particular uh, mesh product happens to be working very well. Um, I think it's a, like a mid power style product with, a, I think, a three to six dB antenna. It's built in, it's, it's a relatively low end product, uh, as, as I mentioned, but it's a, 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 two, a year or two old as well. Anyway, uh, I think the demo, as you, as you already saw, um, Going through an extender does does come at a cost, right? It's it's not free to use the extender. Um, the number one thing is that every packet gets sent twice. If the extender uses wireless backfold, then that's that's sending packets twice over the radio. As we as we saw with this particular de design, where the uh, the chips are disturbing the station as well as doing the backhaul on the same chip, that has an impact. That halves the speed. I mean, we can only ever from this product get half the speed from the extender as we would be able to get um, from the root. Now we're also doubly exposed to any interference and congestion in the environment, right? That get, everything gets sent twice. So any kind of interference we expose ourselves doubly to. Now we also create a lot of congestion in every packet that's sent twice. So, you know, if you're an ISP covering a lot of homes in a particular neighborhood, you, you should be worried about that. And of course the handovers themselves while this particular steering event uh, only took a couple hundred milliseconds, you know, it, you know, 200 milliseconds is not nothing, right? You would notice something like that, um, certainly in a, in a Wi-Fi phone call or, uh, or even maybe a, a Zoom session like this. So, so really the station should use the extender only when it absolutely has to, when, when we can verify that uh, the extender would, would provide a better service. Well, How's the station going to know that? It turns out this is a very complicated problem in, in Wi-Fi. This really is the root at, at why we need to test these systems so well. And the issue sort of starts with the, with the design of how Wi-Fi was designed to begin with, right? The mobility management, the decision to roam, is a feature of the station in Wi-Fi. You know, cellular networks work differently, right? They're, in cellular networks, it's the network who decides where you need to go. So if you think about this mobility problem from the station point of view, it's quite, it's quite tricky to know where to connect it, right? Um, in, in a mesh like uh, the one that we just tested, only one of the nodes is connected to the internet. Uh, it, it may have a different radio than the extender, but let's just say it has a similar radio. Yeah, now, the extender can only, uh, may only be able to deliver half the speed uh, that the root can. You know, there's also congestion, uh, loading in the environment, um, these are difficult things for the for the station to know. Now, Wi-Fi has um, some um, technologies, namely 802.11k, V, and R, to to make some sense of this situation. But it turns out that uh, the mesh products out there use also a lot of proprietary techniques um, to figure this stuff out. Uh, and certainly, with stations that adhere to the V standard very well. Um, these stations are, um, are, um, are easier to steer and easier to connect to the right uh, uh, node. But anyway, I mentioned that uh, there's going to be a lot of demonstrations uh, here. So let's do the second one. Uh, this really is, is going to be quite cool. Um, we are demonstrating for the first time uh, live uh, uh, something that we've recently developed here at, um, at Octoscope that we call field to lab 
replay. Uh, essentially, this technology allows us to uh, go into um, uh, an environment of interest, let's call it a house or, a, or an office or even an open uh, air uh, environment, and capture the propagation characteristics that are uh, prevalent uh, in that environment. Um, and we can then take that capture and replay it um, on the octoscope uh, test bed. And we can subject devices such as access points, mesh networks, or, or stations uh, under different kind of tests in that environment. It, you know, from the station's point of view, it's, it's as if we were in that house that we, that we captured the propagation characteristics of. They, it's, they don't really know any difference. So to sort of illustrate, um, uh, we're doing a demo here. Um, and uh, what we did earlier this week is we went to a two-story house here in the Boston area. Um, you know, looks a little bit like this. Um, uh, the house had a basement. And we set up a um, three-node mesh in this home. Uh, the root node, the one that's uh, connected to the internet, we, we set that in the basement. And then we had an extender on both of the floors. And we used uh, uh, also a recently launched product uh, that, uh, that we've just launched called the FieldPal to capture the propagation environment. Now the FieldPal can do a lot of things, but one of the things it can do is it can, it can make these uh, on-site measurements. Um, so, um, so what we did is we, 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 we captured a, a walk uh, inside this house. We started in the basement on, in, in one corner of the house. We walked um, you know, through the basement, um, through the stairs to the first floor, did a, a, a little um, a tour on the first floor, uh, again took the, the stairs, uh, went to the second floor, and walked um, to the opposite corner of the house uh, on the second floor. Now, um, what we captured looks a little bit like this. So, um, so this is the walk from the basement um, to the second floor. Um, you know, these are um, we, we're il illustrating this measurement now as in form of an of an RSSI uh, measurement across time. As you can see here in the beginning of the walk, when we're in the basement, the root node is is the most dominant. As we enter the the first floor, uh, the extender on that floor. Uh, has the strongest signal. And as we uh, enter the second floor, the, uh, the extender on the second floor is, is now the, uh, the node um, with, the, um, with the highest signal. Now, we're going to be demonstrating this capture uh, with a two-node system, um, just like the, the manual demo. So we, again, we have the root node here on the top chamber. Um, the extender corresponding now to the extender on the first floor in that house. We have uh, here in this chamber, again, we're using the same exact station um, that we used in the, in the previous demo. But, but now the difference is that we, we use these measurements, you know, the green curve to drive the attenuator connecting the station to the road. And we use the, the measured gray curve to drive the attenuator between the station and the extender. We, we do the, these completely synchronized, just as captured in the environment. So this, from a station's point of view, this is the exact equivalent of making that walk inside that house. And it's actually the same thing for the mesh uh, as well. So let's uh, see how that goes. Um, I will be starting a couple of scripts here. Uh, and I have this, this test is going to be taking four minutes. So we're going to be taking this slowly. Um, as you see, we, we, we start at 600 megabits per second here. So this means that uh, we are connected to the root in the basement. And uh, soon uh, the attenuators should start kick in. Here we go. Uh, the attenuator, uh, towards the root node is, in, is increasing and we see a corresponding dip um, on the throughput as well as the phi rates. Um, 
we are taking a, a slow tour here uh, in the basement. Um, so uh, just bear with us. Um, soon uh, we will enter. I think now we are at the stairs in between the um, the, uh, the 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 basement and the um, uh, uh, the first floor. Now we are uh, on the first floor. As we just saw, we walked past the extender on the first floor. Notice how we only got 300 megabits during that time. So it means that uh, we were connected to the extender. Here's where the handover happened, basically. Now we are walking further uh, in on the first floor and uh, we'll be soon hitting the second floor here. And uh, let's see what kind of uh, throughput dips we might be getting since the extender on the first floor will be relatively far away. Uh, okay, it looks like we might have just passed the, the, the lowest point here, or I'm wondering if we're coming to that. It uh, looks like we're coming into that now. Hey, while so, you're uh, while you're watching it, maybe you sure. want a question. Uh, yeah, of course. Yeah, this is another two minutes, and it's pretty boring. So. Okay, this one came in on the chat. Does the recording of the home have any scaling issues with the instruments, given the ADC and FBM of the instrument towards lower SNR to be considered? Um, so let's see. I think the question is, um, I'm not sure what the end part of that means. I don't know, uh, Naveen, if you want me to, if you want to raise your hand, we can unmute you, you can ask it. But I think the question is, you know, will you, will there be some sort of bias in terms of your measurement of the path losses based on the measuring instruments themselves? So we, we have basically calibrated the, that out, hopefully. Um, so um, we've taken into account um, the, the measurement instrument as well as the, 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 the instruments emitting the signal um, uh, here. So, um, so, so that we end up uh, with, um, with just the path loss being, being the thing that was measured. And so in this way, um, uh, this becomes independent of the measurement device as well as of the, 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 the access points being used. Uh, we, we, we end up with the, with the path loss and then we can apply this path loss profile to, uh, to any, um, basically any, any, any device under test. Uh, and if we use other uh, stays uh, for the test, then we would have to calibrate it a little bit, but it's a relatively simple uh, calibration. All right, uh, here we go. So this is the full walk. We're looking at the plot here um, uh, on PowerPoint of the same measurement that we just looked at. Just uh, uh, So this is, the, this is the throughput that we just saw. We, we, we were served um, by, the, uh, by the root node here in the beginning of the walk and, and we performed the, the walk forwards to the second floor and then backwards back to, the, uh, back to the basement. So we get great throughput here in the beginning and the end because we are served by the root node. And here in the middle, we were served by the extender on the first floor. And as you can see, we saw a little dip here when we were on the second floor at the furthest corner. The, the extender couldn't quite reach that. So that's pretty cool. Oh, sorry, um, and yeah, sorry, go no question going on here. So the question uh -huh. is, if we don't share the front hall and the back hall, then would we see a flat line? And I think the next part is just a clarification. If there are two radios, would the transition be smooth? Um, this, these are excellent questions. I think um, the first, uh, if, if we have a tri-band situation where we don't share the same radio for the front hall and back hall, then certainly we would see something much more flatter. In fact, if we had an Ethernet-based back hall um, from the extender to the root, then, then the, I would say the, the, the line would be almost flat. Now, there is, of course, that couple hundred milliseconds of, of gap and and, and, and we will see some sort of a dip like this, but it would be smoother. So we've got a couple of questions going. So why uh -huh. don't we just take those right now? How do we get the RSSI before and after the handover event 
along with the BSS ID details and handover speeds. Is it from packet captures that look similar to Wireshark captures? Yeah, so the uh, so let me let me maybe first take the RSSI aspect of it. So as you noticed, we were using the uh, Octoscope StayPal test instrument. So as, as long as we're using our own test instruments, we get very rich KPIs from those, RSSI being one. Um, that's what we were plotting there on the real-time uh, user interface. Now, uh, if we were interested, and we would certainly be interested uh, in the in the handover time, you know, we were using V there and not R, but but we'd be able to. So we have a we have a test cases that basically use packet captures to to notice the when the when the messages are issued and then when the when the handover is complete. So. Uh, that kind of real-time plot, you know, we only see a, a dot on that plot once a second. So they, this type of plotting technique is not really adequate for uh, analyzing, you know, millisecond level events. And but then there's a there's a similar or related question, which from David uh, Herman asking, does the state pal support uh, KV and R? Uh, it supports K and V. I personally don't, I'm not entirely sure if it supports R. Would you happen to remember that? Um, I haven't tested R on it. So the, the, the thing that the R is kind of rare, uh, especially in the consumer side of the business, right? Um, it's certainly used in, in the enterprise space, but we have a lot of uh, consumer side customers. So I think we'll have to um, take that question and answer it later on. But I know K and V are supported. And, and, and it's um, the PayPal. Um, uh, does uh, has a very nice V implementation. Um, we'll talk later about um, sort of various improv issues that that there are in V, and and our implementation happens to be one of these easy ones. So um, let's move on. So um, this is the throughput plot that we we were just looking at. Now a question that you might ask is, well, is this good? You know, is this is this optimal behavior? Turns out this is a, a question that's quite easy to answer with our field to lab replay technology. What you're looking at here is a superimposed image of two different plots. We essentially performed that same test that we just looked at, but what we did is we locked our StayPal at first with the root node only. And, and the, the green curve is the throughput that we got from the root node. As you can see, we've got great speeds here in the, the beginning and the end, but essentially almost no internet access here when we were on the second floor. Now the gray curve is the same exact walk, but now we lock the stay pal onto the extender on the first floor. So as you can see, we, we did get some throughput uh, from it from the basement. Now, obviously root was a lot better, but the, but the extender was the dominant technology here in the middle. And what we can do is we can combine these two graphs and basically take the highest value at any given moment. And we get this thick, thick curve here, right? This would be the, let's call it the highest achievable speed, or let's call it the ideal performance on along, along this walk path. And what we can do is we can compare the orange uh, curve to the, um, to the ideal curve or the highest achievable curve. And and this is what we see. So as you can see, actually this particular mesh system delivers almost the, the, the ideal speed at all times. There are a couple of deviations. Number one, there are two of these handover events as we, we get handed over from the root to the extender and back. You know, there's a, there's a little dip here in the performance because of that. And then interestingly here, on the first floor, there's a, there's a section of the first floor that is actually better served by the node in the basement. It's, it's, it's the area that's just above the root, the root node. So we would have been better served if, we had, if, the, if the mesh had steered us to the root node. Now, it didn't do that. I'm assuming because the benefit wasn't that great, right? We, the deviation is only about 50 megabits per second here. So pretty good. Now, the beauty of the Octoscope test system and this field to lab replay technology is that we can run all sorts of variants of the same test. So here is a three node variant of the same thing. So this is the maximum achievable speed that, that 
this system could deliver along this walk path. So what I basically did is I added the blue curve here, now um, corresponding to the speed that the extender on the second floor would deliver uh, if we were only connected to that. And interestingly, as you can see, the extender on the second floor uh, in, in the location that it's at actually works a little bit better than the extender on the first floor. Uh, the maximum speed is, for the most part, achievable either through the root or the extender on the second floor. There are a couple of these sections where the gray curve is the dominant, but, but really, you know, if you, if you were to place extenders in this house, you would probably want to actually put it on the second floor. Now we can then replay a variant of the, of the automatic demo that I just saw, showed. So we can set up a three node uh, system on the octoscope uh, test bed, you know, root node against here in the top chamber and the two extenders in the, in the smaller chambers. And we can use uh, the attenuator profiles corresponding to the three measurements that we, we performed at the house to drive synchronously these, um, these three attenuators. And we will achieve a virtual walk through the house. And in fact, we did that. And this is the throughput that we got. So the throughput walk from the basement uh, to the second floor and back with a system uh, that now has three nodes. And we can compare that to the ideal. This is that comparison. So notice again, we have a, we have a handover event here, um, a little deviation from the, from the ideal. We have um, interesting two dips here in the middle, kind of symmetrically around the point. Uh, of the furthest uh, location here on the second floor. I mean, I haven't looked at the trace, but I'm guessing these are maybe some kind of handover events. But the really interesting aspect of this whole thing is this region here on the right. So as we were performing a virtual walk back to the basement, the mesh took quite a long time before it steered us to the road node. I don't know why, you know, of course you, you know, we could, we could take traces, uh, you know, with our synchro sniffing technology uh, and, and start analyzing this. But if I was the tester for the system, I would say this looks like a bug to me. You know, it took basically, you know, the root node was clearly the best node here for, for about at least 20 seconds, maybe 25 seconds. And it took quite a long time for the, for the mesh to recognize that. So, um, um, so I would submit that to the vendor. Uh, if they agree that that was a bug um, and if they deliver some new firmware uh, to, to me that, that um, is alleged to fix this bug, then you know, it, would it would be the world's easiest thing to, to, to replay this test. You know, it would take 240 seconds essentially to see if we now still see this deviation or whether the, the orange curve is now closer to the ideal curve. Hey, Yane. Yeah. Um, so you do have a question. I figure you may want to talk about this one a little bit. Um, the question is, uh, was the survey capture manually imported into the test bed, or is it done by somehow importing the survey file into the test bed itself? Maybe you want to talk about the actual process for converting the field PAL measurements into the attenuation settings. Right. Yeah. So. Um, uh... So the, the technology is relatively new. Um, and so we're still um, working on some of the finalizing uh, touches of that, but the, it's envisaged as a completely uh, automatic process. So, so you essentially, you, you go to the field, you use the field pal to, to capture the environment. And then, you know, you have, you have tools available to you. You, you, you essentially import that into the, uh, into the Octobox system and, and then just basically choose what kind of walk you want to perform, right? Um, we can perform, you know, and, and what kind of a configuration you want to expose to that walk, right? Whether it's a single node, two node, three node, um, you know, we can, we can change the walk speed, we can change the direction, we can add stops, you know, we can, we can go forward, stop for 10 seconds, go back. We, you know, there's, there's infinite variance uh, uh, in, in how the, the system can be replayed and, and, the, and the process is going to be, uh, you know, automated and, 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 and hopefully easy to use. All right. Um, we have a raised hand. 
Sure. Uh, question? I have uh, two uh, questions. The first one is just now you demonstrate to the the um, effective uh, effect of the of the roaming. But how about to the band steering? So from uh, steering from uh, 2.4 gig to 5 gig, uh, does it can test validate such scenario? This is my first question. And the second one is. Uh, does the uh, octoscope well? Uh, uh, does octoscope si simulate the the some mesh uh, uh, protocol behaviors uh, such as uh, easy mesh or uh, dot eleven s or some uh, uh, even some proprietary mesh solution or uh, these test devices as not relative to any uh, mesh protocols. All right, um, clear enough. Uh, let me let me address the first question first. So so just to play back, you're 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 asking. Well, you know, we we saw AP steering here. You know, can we essentially test band steering? Well, um, you know, from a V message point of view, it's it's the same exact message. You know, it's just it's a it's a different BSS ID. You know, the the, the AP the steering AP just gives its own two point four um, uh, gigahertz version of the BSS ID. So. So from our point of view, it's the same exact test. Um, um, we did not, um, uh, this, this, in this test that we just saw, the mesh quite possibly could have been performing band steering to create, you know, perhaps coverage benefits. We, we would have been able to, to, to measure the impacts of that. You know, maybe these little dips are in fact uh, band steering. I don't know. I, I haven't looked into it, but um, but uh, maybe that's a, a, a great uh, way to 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 go start um, addressing your second question. So so the so you asked whether <coughs> whether we are essentially whether we simulate these mesh protocols themselves, or, or or whether we are more just an environment. We are not a network simulator uh, on our own. I mean, we, we do have golden test instruments, uh, one called the StayPal, which, which is our golden test instrument uh, that can be used to simulate many kinds of different stations. And we have an, a, a golden access point that we call PAL6 that can be used as an access point uh, for testing, but they don't support easy mesh or, um, or 802.11s. We would consider you know, if, if, if those are things that you want to test, then, you know, th these would be attributes of the device under test. The mesh that we saw there could quite possibly be using 802.11s or, or easy mesh in the background. We don't really know. We, we're not, we didn't look at that particular thing. But um, so essentially what the Octoscope uh, system is, it's we can, we can create an environment for you to take any Wi-Fi product into, and then we can characterize the performance of that product while giving a rich set of KPIs and, and traces and things of that, uh, that sort while performing those tests. But we are not a protocol simulator. Okay. If, if that's Got what you want. Thank you yeah, very much. Makes sense. All right. Um, so what we've been looking at here is, is a, a field to lab replay technique for testing Wi-Fi. It's very, very useful technology for all sorts of test cases, especially for mesh because with mesh, the test scenarios become quite complicated very quickly, and a lot of people are more comfortable testing um, meshes uh, in a test house. So with this kind of technology, though, we can replicate the user experience just as captured in a test house, and we're able to replay it in the test bed. So, so this will greatly speed up any kind of testing efforts. And, and also we, we get repeatability and reproducibility that you would never get test, uh, test house. Now, having said that, there are other ways to do test mesh. One approach is to follow uh, performance standards. Um, previously, we had a seminar on the Broadband Forum TR398 effort. Uh, we addressed their first issue that they call issue one. Uh, they are now working on an issue two that's uh, I think is going to be out shortly. And this new version will have um, some performance and, and, and roaming test cases for, uh, for mesh. There is uh, ongoing work uh, in other industry bodies. 
that we are participating in. Wi-Fi Alliance and Etsy, uh, notably. Uh, they, these bodies are also working on performance test standards, and we assume these will cover MESH at some point as well. Just before we go into sort of final Q&A, let me just talk a little bit about the, the interop since I promised earlier on. As I mentioned, there are quite a lot of uh, interop issues uh, with these uh, steering techniques, many in V alone, outlining here a few. Uh, and then if you, um, if you have to use steering with a device that doesn't support V, uh, there are various uh, legacy steering mechanisms, that they, but they have even more interop issues. So a thorough testing of, of steering behavior is an absolute must with any kind of mesh testing program. So with that, let's see if there's any more questions. So we do. We have a question. They're asking, is there anything engaged with Wi-Fi 6 today? Wi-Fi 6? Yes. So our um, test system supports uh, Wi-Fi 6 fully, both from an RF point of view. Um, actually, we support 6E as well from an RF point of view. And our both of our test instruments, the Staypal and the PAL 6, are, are already Wi-Fi 6 compatible or uh, support Wi-Fi 6. Um, the, the entire test bed is, is, is ready for for Wi-Fi 6. Um, 6 E support, you know, the new frequencies that um, FCC has now opened up. We will have uh, support in our PAL 6 E test instrument um, early next year. And then the stay PAL will um, probably support it uh, a little bit later, maybe late first quarter. Can the stay PAL be configured so that uh, instead of being locked to a specific channel or band, it would be able to roam? I believe the answer to that question is yes. I'm pretty sure that you can go into a you know a regular scan mode uh, like any like any other station. You, you can lock it as well. Yeah, you can lock it. Mm -hmm. And then there's just a final question, which might as well just talk about: uh, Do you see any aspects of the wi of Wi-Fi six that the extenders can benefit from? So, is there something specific to Wi-Fi six that I guess helps from a mesh protocol point of view? I'll take a little bit of a crack at this while you think while you think about it. Uh, one of the things that Wi-Fi six, you know, has at least more uh, kind of robustly than uh, was than Wi-Fi five were things like um, uh, you know 160 megahertz channels and uh, and eight stream connections. We have uh, heard from various operators that they would use, especially things like, uh, you know, eight streams more as a backhaul technology than anything else. Um, you know, that is not focused on the, on the front hall side, just obviously because it's gonna be quite hard to get um, stations that support that many streams. But since you're building a mesh, you can do whatever you want. So uh, just from a, enhanced backhaul point of view, I think I'd say that's at least one aspect. Any yeah, other I can't thoughts? think of, I, I can't think of I mean it's a it's a it's a, a major re architecture of the Wi Fi rate interface as, as everybody knows. So it's going to benefit all sorts of usage scenarios, including mesh. But I don't I can't think of anything specific that uh, that that would address mesh uh, in it. But yeah the, the benefits will be uh, highly seeable I think. Yeah, I think there are some, you know, potentially even others, uh, although we haven't heard, you know, so much about this already, but I mean, you could imagine, uh, you know, a mesh system making use of OFDMA so that instead of serving, uh, you know, for example, instead of a root node serving different mesh extenders uh, at different times, if it were possible, it could serve them simultaneously. I mean, you, that would be quite an enhancement, although probably a very specific use case. Um, so I, I don't know uh, if we're going to see that anytime uh, in the in the near future. But there, there are definitely, you can imagine things that would that could help quite a bit. Yeah, I would I would say that um, um... You know, going back to that picture that I showed, uh, that uh, that uh, talked about um, the difficulty in deciding which node to connect through, um, Wi-Fi six will certainly have a, a major impact into that decision, because um, 
of the new types of avenues available, right? So just just the fact that 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 we have now a very efficient um, technology available on 2.4 gigahertz, I think opens up some interesting um, techniques that uh, one could take advantage of uh, of in a mesh. Um, you know, you could you could you could take. Uh, stations that are maybe a little bit lower performing or don't require quite as much um, speed, you could you could maybe take and move them to 2.4, because the service is now better on 2.4 than it would have been uh, in Wi-Fi 5 world. Um, and so I think I think um, steering techniques uh, will probably adapt uh, greatly uh, in Wi-Fi 6 world um, because the radio just just operates so differently, and and, and certainly BSS coloring uh, will have an impact into um, into tightly built networks, uh, especially in the ISP context, uh, you know, you're 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 oftentimes your own biggest self interferer. So, uh, so Wi-Fi six uh, will have, uh, and and then the BSS coloring uh, feature will have uh, an impact into how these uh, how these products will work in the future. And one more is the okay, two more. Uh, is the new system available to customers already or when it will be available? Not sure what the new system refers to, but maybe Yana, you could just talk in general about. Yeah, I think I think um, uh, I think the question is probably about this field to lab, lab uh, replay technology. So, yeah, so I, I would encourage uh, you guys to um, to talk through your um, uh, your your sales contacts. But um, yeah, we'll be uh, making this available uh, uh, very shortly. And uh, Thomas, hi Thomas, would like to know will the field pal support Wi-Fi 6E? Uh, a future version of field pal will. Uh, the current version that we're uh, shipping today does not. Um, so, um, you know, field pal in, in many ways is, is, is similar to our stay pal product. It's, just, it's essentially a stay pal in, in, in a different form factor. Well, there's a couple other differences, but uh, but but sort of conceptually, um, and so it's sort of tied to our PayPal roadmap, which I mentioned would be sort of a late first quarter, maybe early second quarter next year type of type of time frame. So, it's the current version of FieldPal only supports Wi-Fi six, not six E yet. Okay, um, we appear to have cleared the questions for the moment. Um, I don't know, uh, Yanni, if you'd like to wrap up here, we can wait and see if there's any more questions that come in. Yeah, you... yeah, so thank you. Um, um, so um, as, as, as always, we will be making this, uh, this session available on YouTube, like, uh, like all of the previous ones. Um, as you can see here, are our, um, we've, we have nine uh, tutorials already. Um, and, uh, and thank you for attending. Uh, and thank you for the, for the lively interaction. Yep, I will. Uh, I'll echo that. Thanks, everybody for attending. Thanks, everyone for your questions. Uh, the YouTube link, there's a question about the YouTube link. Um, everything um, will be uh, there is no YouTube link currently, we haven't put it up yet. But if you go to our uh, website, then um, you can get all of those links. And uh, I don't know if one of the sales guys wants to speak up uh, in uh, in China specifically. Um, are those links somewhere else? Yeah, they will be on the Paralink website. Okay. So if you go to our partner's website, uh, which is uh, part, uh, the partner in China is Paralink, they will have uh, those videos located so that they're accessible via Ch uh, in China. Okay. Um, and yeah, so again, thank you all. Thank you all for your questions. Um, and if uh, you do have questions that occur to you, either oh, website, could you write down here? Um, yep, we can do that. Um, uh, Chuck, could you could you handle that? Um, um, open question. Do you, do you see it or not? I do see it. The question about writing the, down the, the website, you mean? Yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah. You could just put down oh, a Paralink. Paralink and then put ours in there just in case. But you know, we'll follow up with everybody. I'll make sure the information gets out there. Um, yeah, actually I'll, I'll I'll put that up there right now. Okay. 
Um, right. But again, do follow up with your uh, with your local contacts um, or with any of us. And um, we look forward to uh, talking to you again in the, in the next tutorial. Um, right. I'm going to leave this open just briefly while Chuck gets that information oh. there. All right. So, yep. and obviously, just, just in case it's not completely obvious, uh, you can find the information uh, on our site here. Previous videos linked to, and this one will be linked there. All right. Thank you all. And uh, you. see you soon. Bye.